everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, Rob, it's Anna. And it's me, Jackie. Oh boy, you guys. I don't know about you, but you know we've been doing uh, this podcast about behavior analysis and behavior analytic research for, for over five years now. And while- I have been doing it. You have been? Yeah. We have. That's why I said we have been. You said, I don't know about you. Oh, okay. I do know about you. I know you've been here <laughs> the whole time. I think a lot of people probably assume that our favorite interest is podcast or talk about behavior analysis. And while those are great interests, I don't know if they would be our most preferred interests or our uniquest of all interests. And speaking of unique interests, we probably could do a whole episode about unique interests in how we use unique interests in our practice. And to do so, we are very fortunate to have a special guest who is joining us to talk about this topic. Why don't we not waste any time and introduce that special guest over five years? I think she's one of the first people to email us to say thank you for making the show and good job on the show. So we're very excited to get her on herself. And that's Tamika Meadows from the I Love ABA blog. Tamika, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. Of course. I am super, super excited to be here. Thank you for having me. We are very happy as well. And since unique interest was a topic that you are also uniquely interested in, or maybe not uniquely, because all four of us are talking about it on an episode, why don't we spend a little time saying what our own unique interests are? Maybe you could start by telling us all about yourself for our listeners who you know, maybe haven't been to your blog, and then maybe some of your, your favorite interests. So I am a VA living in Atlanta. I entered the field when I was in, in college. I was a psychology major who at the time knew nothing about ABA. And I started working with one family and then over time started seeing more and more families in my area and kind of started to realize that, hey, I think I might want to do this like permanently as a career. And at that point decided to get certified and kind of started on that whole journey. Since I've been a clinician, I've done a little bit of everything. I've done school-based, I've done clinic-based, I've done home-based. At the moment, I'm primarily doing a lot of consulting, kind of professional development, CE creation kind of work. I mostly work with school-aged clients, I'd say 12 and younger. And kind of my, my passions clinically would be new hire training, working with brand new clinicians. I also really, really love family support, caregiver training. And let's see, so special interests, they change because I think for, for most people, they would say that what they're super, super into is subject to vary. So at the moment, a lot of Marvel. I love WandaVision. Mm-hmm. I love streaming a variety of shows on Netflix or Hulu. I love relaxation days, which is what I call my off days where I have nothing to do. And I take it very seriously and I do nothing. So they vary a lot. And if you asked me a month from now, or if you had asked me a month ago, I probably would have had different answers. It's the way it is with interests, isn't it? You know, yeah, you, you like change. it for a while and then they change. Yeah. I think that's kind of the case for most of us. Jackie and Diana, what would you consider your unique interests? Okay, I'll go. I think we all share a unique interest in that we are interested in behavior analysis, which is a pretty niche thing, first of all. (laughs) Very true. But in addition to that, I think I have some unique interests. And one of them is semi-precious rocks and stones. So some of my favorite stones are unikite, obsidian jasper, and fire agate. Mm -hmm. And I also really like abstract expressionism, such as Rothko or Kandinsky. Those are some Paul Clay. Got really hoity-toity over on this side of the microphone. Well, no one ever lets me talk about these things. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I really like those things, and I don't really have anyone to share those interests with. No offense. I feel like I'm very supportive of the the realm. (laughs) I was like, oh, kids, ask your mom about rocks. There's some rocks over there. (laughs) I don't get any takers. (laughs) What about you, Jackie? Well, this is a relatively new, unique interest for me because during COVID, I've been spending many, many hours outside with my young child because she's been at home hanging with me the whole time. 
I am now really excited about identifying bird calls and different birds that I see in the woods, which is fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I also, along that same vein, have now been really excited when I can identify the trees that I walk by, by, you know, what they look like and their leaves. I find plants confusing. Their names are confusing. They are confusing. They all look the same to me. They're just too, there's too much. It's hard because if you think about like how many different types of maple trees there are out there, the difference is, is like a pointy leaf top versus mm-hmm. a rounded leaf top. So you really have to study your leaves. Especially in winter. It's really hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have like a fun botanical garden near us and I love walking through it. And I'm like, I wish I could name all these plants or be someone who's like, oh, look, it's a plant. I don't, <laughs> I don't even it's know. A plant, guys. I can't even look find plant. one name of a plant. You know, it just seems like such a good skill. That's uh-huh. cool, Jackie. I didn't know that about you. Yeah, it's it's new. It's part of this homeschool curriculum that I've been doing. And I actually like really enjoy it. I'm like, oh my gosh, look at that. It's a black cap chickadee in danger because of the number <laughs> of D's that he says at the end. Whoa. All right, now we need to ask it. Rob. Yes, no, you don't need to ask me. I don't Rob, know. we all know about special and unique interests. What are my special and unique interests? I mean, I, I think I'm with Tamika and... Marvel, you know, Marvel's a big interest. And I, you know, I, I like Marvel back when saying, I have a big Marvel fan. Would you get a lot of like quizzical looks like that? What are you talking about? That's not anything anyone cares about as opposed to now when it's, you know, the biggest franchises of all time. Yeah, super of. huge. Yeah. Rob's uh, a true believer. A true believer. That's right. Hey, I met, I met <laughs> Stan Lee. I met Stan Lee once I before know. he passed. I know. <laughs> I know, honey. And then, you know, Star Wars has been a big, a big interest of mine for a long time. And if all has gone well, by the time you're hearing this, I think I will have finished all of the Star Wars books published since 2014, since Disney purchased Star Wars. Like, I finished them all. That was my quarantine activity. I just, like, plowed through Star Wars books. Impressive. It's impressive. Thank you. If you want to know about Mm -hmm. any minor characters who were, like, standing in the background holding a coffee during Empire Strikes Back, you know, I I read a story about them at one point. So I got all that information. Rob's other special and unique interest slash talent is being able to identify almost any voice actor that comes on the television. I am good at that, too. Yeah. Local history. I hear a lot about I like local that. history, too. I hear probably more about that than I do about Marvel. So That's true. I just thought to bring that up. It became too mainstream. I'm, just, I'm niche. You know, I don't want to... Nothing too popular for me. So, right. I think one of the fun things about unique interests that we've probably all developed as, you know, professionals in the field is that you can take your unique interest and find a way to tie it into your job or tie it into a hobby or, or bring it a little bit farther than just being a hobby, you know, cause a hobby people are like, Oh, you spend so much time on it. But if you tie it into your professional work, Oh, everyone's very excited. You know, like, wow, that's so cool that you added that in or that you can bring that, you know, your writing interest or your metaphor from your unique interest into a discussion of, you know, behavior analysis, let's say, you know, which is all of our profession. But what we're going to be talking about tonight is not how to do that, which kind of would be its own fun workshop, but how can we use the unique interests of our clients? Because I'm sure all of us, when thinking about unique interests and thinking about various clients we've worked with or families we've worked with, probably spent more time saying these unique interests are getting in the way of the important, capital I, bold, important stuff. We shouldn't bother with them. And taking a moment to say, you know what, perhaps that wasn't the best tack to take. So we're going to be reading some articles, well, not reading them, but discussing the articles. On, we did read them. We read them. We'll talk about them on how can we use unique interests in developing treatment plans in a variety of ways. Yeah, and I think that's why we also wanted to think of this as incorporating unique or special interests too. So we're not thinking of it as like a exchange, right? Like, oh, you do this and then we'll talk about your mm-hmm. unique or special interests. Like, let's mm-hmm. find other ways that we can incorporate it and thread it throughout our sessions such that the entire session feels a lot more reinforcing and supportive of our clients' unique interests. It's meaningful. Yeah, we're not just talking about first this, then that, but a meaningful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah not so transactional. That's what I couldn't think of. Ooh, that mm. sounds so. Yeah, that is a good word. That sounds gross now, though. It's like, well, it's a transactional mm-hmm. use of unique interests. Right, Ugh. exactly. So that's why we're going to incorporate them. Okay. Yeah. Or as I wanted to and call that's it, why I utilizing have... unique interests for the alliteration. Oh, I'm not one to pass up an alliteration opportunity. I completely <laughs> understand. But that's why I wanted to have Tamika on, because if anyone out there hasn't, found Tamika's blog. Tamika, you make such great points. And basically every post that you make, I'm like, yes, yes, I love what you're saying. And you you bring up all of these, you know, discussions that we're about to have about the importance of client rights and, 
you know, allowing our sessions to be guided by our clients. And I, I love the way that you thread in your personal stories into that. And I'm always just like right there with you 100%. So when I was thinking about this topic, I immediately thought of you because I already knew based on what you had written that you and I were on the same page. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. We, we, we are in the same wavelength when it comes yes. to this, that's for sure. Yes. So thank you for everything that you post out there. I think that it's important. I mean, it's it's kind of my my own special interest, like peeking out in a mm. way, because I'm like, if I'm going to talk about something, like I'm going to make it relevant to myself, which is probably not <laughs> the best way to write to a large group of people. But that's honestly what I do. I'm like, if I'm going to talk about this, I'm going to talk about it this way, because this is the way I'm interested in it. And then very weirdly, other people were also like, yeah, I'm interested in that way, too. And that's kind of how that happened. I don't think that's weird at all because I think that's being authentic. Honestly, that's like the core, I think, of what we're doing right here in this topic, right? Is that's very true. We want to be authentic with our clients and honestly yes. sit down with them and say, I want to learn about what this thing is that's cool to you. And that's so different than saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. In a minute, you can tell me about that thing that's cool. Right. To you, right. right. So it just changes the whole dynamic of the relationship. You have to have that in order to have the trust and support that's really needed in order to create a conducive environment for learning. So Absolutely. I think that you're right on track. And I think that's why people are drawn to your blog, because you are very authentic. I, I very much appreciate that. All right. I'm fangirling a little bit. I'm going to reel it back oh in. Oh, my Rob's, God. No, that's going to tell us me. the articles. That would be moi. <laughs> <laughs> that would not be you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we have a number of articles to discuss tonight, and we might not be able to go into as much of a depth for all of them, which is fine because not all of them, I think, went into as much depth of ways that you could use unique interests. They sort of, in, they sort of, you know, various amounts of depth, I suppose. But we're going to start with a classic. Surprise, we haven't done it before, but it is a perfect one to start us off, which is balancing the right to habilitation with the right to personal liberties, the rights of people with developmental disabilities to, to eat too many donuts and take a nap by Bannerman, Sheldon, Sherman, and Harchick from the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, 1990. We'll also be discussing effects of circumscribed interests on the social behaviors of children with autism spectrum disorders by Boyd, Conroy, Mansell, Nakao, and Alter from the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders, 2007. Using perseverative interests to elicit joint attention behaviors in young children with autism, theoretical and clinical implications for understanding motivation by Vismara and Lyons from the Journal of Positive Behavior Interventions, 2007 incorporating the thematic ritualistic behaviors of children with autism into games, increasing social play interactions with siblings by Baker, also from the Journal of Positive Behavior Interventions from the year 2000. And finally, using the special interests of autistic children to facilitate meaningful engagement and learning by Davey from Good Autism Practice 2020. So Tamika, we would just really love it if you would start us off by talking about the Bannerman article. It's kind of, you know, it's a classic. I think we all probably read it in grad school or for fun at some point, you know, but it, it is one of those oldies but goodies that comes up all the time. If you're reading anything about human rights, you're reading anything about adults with disabilities, Bannerman's going to be in the citations at the end. What is relevant about Bannerman? Why does it keep coming back to us these days? You know, why is it it's such an evergreen article? This is a favorite for me. I feel like it's one of those that just never loses its relevance. It's just, it's just, it's a conversation that we we keep returning to. And I feel like it's a conversation we need to keep returning to, but it's, it's definitely one of my faves. I love to, I love to talk about it. What is it for folks either who haven't read it in a while or who possibly haven't read it yet and we're, we're making a face at you like, hmm, haven't read it yet right now? I think we're all doing that. Uh, <laughs> I assume we all over our microphones. You never know. Not everyone has read it. Well, they sh I'm making a face anyway because it's my right to make a face. Whenever it's my right to make a face and eat oh, too many donuts. Oh, I like that. It's my <laughs> right to make a face. Cute. I'm eating too many donuts while doing so. <laughs> So would you mind kind of, Tamika, doing a quick kind of summary of the key points of Bannerman and colleagues' article? The primary focus of the article for anyone who either hasn't read it in a long time, because I know for a lot of us, it was it was required at some point in, in grad school. So maybe you haven't read it for a long time, or maybe you're, you're not familiar, but kind of the key point is the right to choose, which simultaneously is going to mean the right to refuse, because anytime you're choosing something, you're refusing something else. So the right to choose in the context of being a service provider with a great deal of control 
over the clients that we serve because we do serve populations who don't make many choices in their day-to-day life. Choices are made for them. And so it's kind of this deep dive into the balance of habilitation. And that's a word you're going to see over and over when you read this article. I would suggest you replace that word with intervention just because it might help you frame this mm. a little bit better if you think about that word as intervention because that's it's the same idea. Like we're going in and we're trying to help an individual overcome barriers. So the balance of habilitation and the right to personal liberty. So the conclusion that they reach by the end of the article is that it's not like yin and yang. Like they're, they're not opposites. It's not one or the other. Like the goal is that you are providing intervention to consumers who need said intervention, but you are also respecting the rights and wishes and desires of that individual. So they open up with some good background information around legislation, like the 1975 Education for All Handicapped Children Act. And they kind of talk about how this legislation happened because of the fact that there was a history of inadequate services for people with disabilities. And so we had to kind of put mandates in place to say, hey, you know, this individual has the right to live and they have the right to go to school. And so, you know, we we kind of pushed that through and then funding sources were starting to make funding contingent on meeting certain standards, the clients that you serve and, you know, and that's great and that's a really good thing, but kind of a a side effect, an unwanted side effect of that was that there's all these people making decisions about this individual with disabilities and no one's really asking that individual with disabilities what they want. And they spend a lot of time in the article giving like very specific examples of that. So there's a quote from Skinner that I really like in the article that says, choice is anything but free. And I mean, I feel like that's like a whole like three, four hour conversation, but (laughs) you know, cause it like, there's so much there, like choice is not free. But if you think about it, it's so so true because most of us have what we imagine to be choice in our life, but we want that imagined choice. Like like we want the illusion of choice in our day-to-day life. We want to believe I'm making choices and decisions that impact my own life and they're not being made for me, even though the reality is probably much closer to an illusion of freedom and choice, which Mm. basically means you can choose what you choose, but you cannot choose the impact of what you chose. You, You can't choose what happens after you choose what you chose. They also talk about kind of the present status, which keep in mind, this is 1990. So when I say present status, it was quite a while ago. But listen to this. This is really interesting. So the present status is that clients have little to no input in treatment goals or procedures used. Behaviors were being taught with no regard for client preference. Choice making was not being taught. There were not enough opportunities for clients to make choices. Like that doesn't sound so retro, does it? Like that still happens Mm. in, in facilities and schools. And like, that's not, so to me reading it, it's like, wow, that's super relevant to like right now. And this was written in 1990. That's crazy. And it's in the, the best interest of the client to be allowed to skip an intervention session to say, I don't want to work today, or I don't want to do puzzles today, or I don't, I don't want to make my bed. I don't, you know, or like it says in the title to eat too many donuts and take a nap. Mm -hmm. They also go on to talk about the effects of choice. So there's like a really long section of the article where they're talking about other research in their article. So for example, most people will choose a situation in which a choice is available over a situation in which it's not. Mm-hmm. And most people will participate more when there are choices available than when they are not. Mm-hmm. Also, problem behaviors are exhibited less frequently when an individual has opportunities for choice. And I mean, I feel like for most of us as BCBAs, we know that to be true. But you know, you may or may not have known that the research actually backs that up and says, yeah, that, that's true. They do point out some kind of research cautions, which I also really like towards the end of the article, like they talk about the issues that need to be considered. For example, a lot of the studies that they cite use within subject analyses. So it makes it hard to kind of pinpoint the responses of individual subjects and the effects of variables over time. 
they also talk about that a lot of these studies were conducted in research settings. So it's, it's a little less known, okay, well, what would that look like at home? What would that look like in the classroom? What kind of effects would we get if we apply the same strategy in natural situations? And they talk about in many of the studies, subject perception of whether or not they made choices was rarely assessed, which I think is super important to point out because most of us know when we have choices available, but for a lot of the populations that we serve, they might not pick up on that. So if I don't know that I can choose, I'm not likely to choose. I'm going to wait for someone mm-hmm. to tell me this is what you can do right now or this is what you can eat. So th- I thought that was a really good point that they raised. And so for the conclusion, they made like, oh my God, so many points that I just loved. But like <laughs> to highlight <laughs> a few service providers should challenge ourselves to work harder at teaching and providing opportunities for choice within the context of habilitation. Again, translate that as intervention. We should emphasize independent living skills and other functional behaviors that are preferred by the client, not us, not developmental norms, the client. Mm -hmm. Clients should have input on decisions about what they will and will not learn and how they will be taught. And for some of you thinking, well, I, I can't ask my clients what they want to do today. Like they, they either would not understand the question or they're not able to speak. It actually gives examples of how you can assess this information for clients who can't speak or don't understand kind of questions like that. You can do preference assessments and analyze how they respond to various stimuli or various programs starting at various times of the day, like, you know, be a BCBA, like track it. And then, you know, look at the data and see what it's telling you about what this individual wants to do. Another good point they made is teaching a functional yes and no. I love that. As clients can learn to make super complex decisions by just having options listed, kind of the advantages and disadvantages discussed, and then saying, all right, now do you want this or this? I thought that was really cool. They also talk about more training is needed for service providers and teachers so that we're better prepared to encourage and teach choice making. Like, basically, don't assume that people know how to teach choices because they might Mm. not. Like, they might need extra help in how to even present that as a target of intervention for their clients. My absolute favorite is client refusal slash withdrawal of assent which is my wording, not the mm-hmm. author's wording, but I feel like that's what we would call it now is when you withdraw your assent during the middle of the session or during intervention, how do I respond to that? And so they give an example of like, if you tell a client, okay, it's time to take a bath and they're watching TV and they're like, I don't want to take a bath. Like, what's your next step? Hmm. You know, do you just like move right into error correction and start like applying all these prompts and I'm going to turn the TV off or do you kind of take a step back and say, okay, let's see, do you have to take a bath right now? Like, is that the most important thing in the world? Like, could you take it in the morning and I let you finish this show? Like, like they basically suggest that you should treat client refusal as like an indicator that I didn't choose that you chose that. So I don't want to do that. That's what you want me to do. And this is me telling you, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. I thought that was like super relevant. And just to kind of like summarize like the biggest takeaways, particular care must be applied to highly vulnerable populations like children, research participants, or patients receiving medical care therapy, because these groups may not be aware of their rights, or they may give up their rights unknowingly in order to obtain treatment. So a lot Mm -hmm. of us work with kids. We have to be like extra vigilant to make sure that our clients know they have choices. They know what those choices are and that we won't be mad or upset or, you know, it it won't be a worsening set of conditions for them to make a choice. We have to be super clear about that when we're doing our jobs. Mm -hmm. And basically choice making should be integrated into the habilitation process. And this is not in the article, 
but I feel like there should just be a mic drop right there. <laughs> and I don't think people were doing that in 1990. So I will add that for the authors that when you finish the article, you should just hear in your head, like a mic drop because they just like, they presented their point beautifully and then just kind of left you with some lovely conclusion. So you guys should go read it. If any reprints happen of this article, hopefully they'll add. Yes, hopefully they'll call me and be open to feedback because I have some. (laughs) But I I think think it's amazing. Thank you for starting us off with this discussion. I think it's one of those, you know, very multifaceted issues of how do we teach choice? What choices are the most important? What are the rights? And I think the other thing that probably for most professionals out there, I bet almost every single one is saying, you know what? Yes, yes, Mm -hmm. I do want to put more choice in. Mm -hmm. And when you're thinking about it, the limiting factor then becomes A, what choices? And B, who is paying me? And they're potentially paying me to kind of, could you like not provide those choices? Because you got to provide X, Y, Z services. And that that kind of is its own topic, which we're going to bypass a bit tonight. Because what we'd rather do is drill down into, okay, what kinds of choices? And what Mm -hmm. if we took what I think most of us would traditionally, or at least earlier in our careers, would have seen as potentially, in our own opinions, well, this is an important behavior, which is right. more whatever we're going to end up calling it, and that's going to be kind of our next topic, our, our thematic play, our ritualistic play, stereotypic play, whatever we're going to end up calling it. But those specialized interests that we as practitioners just don't really, we're, we're not interested in them. They're not interesting mm-hmm. to us for whatever reason, whether we think they're getting in the way whether we think they're just, we're not as interested in talking about them because they're not our specific interests we talked about at the top of the show and how we can use those, should we be using those in the choice making and treatment developing process. So I think Bannerman still covers, you know, great umbrella of all of that. For anyone who was worried we were going to be talking about policy making or anything like that, you know, we're not going to. We're assuming that you all would love to follow the ethical code in using client preferences as much as possible and getting great outcomes. We're going to take a big assume everyone says, yes, we love Bannerman and we're totally on board. Now what? So we're going to get into the now what with the rest of the episode. And to be fair, Rob, the new ethical code does talk about gaining client assent whenever possible for the new ethical codes that are coming out in 2022. Yay. So now Tamika's favorite is part of our ethical code that we are required to do. Which so I love. I, I yeah, me amazing. too. Yeah. Yeah. As we all talked about, it is very explicit in the update where we're mm-hmm. getting that client assent. It's not sort of that, <laughs> like, well, wouldn't it be great? It's like, no, it's right there. Do it. You have to. It's ethical. It's best practice. It's what we should be doing. Good point, Jackie. All right. Well, why don't we start before we get into the articles? We're going to need to do a quick operational definitionizing because every single one of these articles refers to (laughs) unique interests in a different way. They call it Mm -hmm. something different, though I think they're all talking about the same topography or similar topographies of behavior. Circumscribed interest. Oh, I thought you knew them all off the top of your head. You I look- did, but then I got <laughs> myself distracted and I forgot. Oh, oh prescribed interests, ritualistic mm-hmm. interests, repetitive interests, specialized interests, unique interests, perseverative, perseverative interests. interests. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't think maybe I covered them all in all of the articles. Yes. Did I get them all? I think so. Thematic oh, ritualistic. Thematic, yeah. thematic uh, rituals is behaviors. mine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Which sure. is apparently different than ritualistic. Right. Behaviors. So so all of these would fall under the old third column of the diagnosis, which mm-hmm. is restricted and repetitive behavior in the new second column of the diagnosis. Mm-hmm. But I think more specifically here, if we're thinking about it from the diagnostic perspective, we're not talking about just stereotypic behavior that might take motor or vocal forms, but more a really intense topic of interest that yeah. an individual has a lot to say about most of the time. A more complex class of behavior in terms of, you know, most of the participants in these articles were either had topics that they wanted to discuss. They had play sort of themes that they would use. So they'd often be using various toys in the environment. They may or may not be interacting with other people to engage with those toys uh, in a certain way. So yeah, yeah, more complex than to say, I think stereotypy would, would capture. So 
I think unique interest was was the terminology that we've sort of been using in all of our notes because I think that more than most of the article discussions, I think captures the breadth of topographies of behavior that we're discussing. Though, I mean, again, I think there's there's room for other terminology. Certainly, I think none of us would want to use perseverative interests. You know, while I think that might capture the component of being a very specific interest that keeps coming up, even if the stimuli change or even if the mm-hmm. audience is clearly not interested, I think when we talk about perseveration, it's very clear that it's a word that has... Negative. A neg- yeah, it's a negative connotation. Mm-hmm. Too, it like is. That, Tamika. Because, I mean, a lot of these words and terms you guys are saying, like, I still hear all the time, like, you know, obsessions and fixations and he's stuck on this, she's stuck on this. Like, it's very negative language Mm and people describe these things to me and are saying, can we work on removing this thing? So I think intentionally calling it just unique interest kind of removes that, that stigma, like like right off the top, like I'm not going to judge this thing you really, really like to talk about. I don't need to do that in order to help with the issue. And I think that just kind of the way across the articles, it was described so differently. I feel like it's like the snapshot of field mm-hmm. because I hear it described like a thousand different ways, but I know what they're talking about mm-hmm. when they say it. You know, I know, I know what they mean. And I think because we all started off this episode saying what some of our unique interests are, right? And I think that it's important to note that everyone has something that they're uniquely mm-hmm. interested in, right? And, and some that of, no one else cares about. No, I was going to say, and oh. some of those are more... <laughs> or very or more, few people. <laughs> right, they're either more mainstream or less mainstream, right? So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like you were saying, Rob, it, it used to be that liking Marvel and comic books made you a big old nerd. You're still a big old nerd, but now a lot of other people <laughs> share your <Are> interests. <laughs> so it's not looked at as being outside of the mainstream anymore. Right now, it's very socially acceptable yeah. to be into Marvel. And- well, not the way I talk about well, Marvel. It's still very nerdy. It, it, and- I know it is, but you know, you, you see where I'm going with this, right? You make it weird. But you haven't changed. I haven't even seen it. So that's okay. Jackie. You haven't seen it, Jackie, the one Marvel. <laughs> the no, Marvel? I, haven't I haven't seen that Marvel. Everyone keeps talking about. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but my point is, Rob, you didn't change, right? But the society around nope. you <laughs> changed <laughs> such that what was used to be a really unique interest is now a very mainstream interest. So depending on, where you were in time, someone might look at you and say, wow, this kid is really perseverating on these Mm -hmm. Marvel characters. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should do something about that. Everyone else is going to think he's weird. And now, lo and behold, you're the coolest cat on the block because you know all of the Marvel characters, right? Every single one. Every single one. But it was the perspective of society that changed from then to now. Somewhat. We're getting there. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) So just because someone's Unique interest falls outside of the mainstream doesn't automatically mean it needs to be something that is Absolutely. changed, mm-hmm. right, is where I'm trying to, trying to get. Took yeah. me a little while to get there. I also like the term unique interest, if, if we sort of use that as our umbrella term. It can be used as sort of a neutral description. Mm-hmm. I think it leans more towards it's a positive because everyone should have things they're interested in. But it also doesn't preclude someone from saying, my son has some unique interests or my daughter has unique interests. I love that they have those interests. I'm a little worried that they're missing out on other things. So you're coming Mm -hmm. at it from more of a problem-solving aspect of, it's great that they have these interests. However, all of us have unique interests that if we spend too much time with them can become harmful. So it's not a matter of, well, if we call them unique interests, then we can't, you know, cut down how many hours the kid's spending on those unique. No, that's not what we're talking about because there there is a, there's too much of a good thing. We we can't all eat too many donuts, even though it's our right to eat as many as we Mm -hmm. want to. So you still can use unique interests and and balance that with a need for, well, wouldn't it be great if we, you know, showed this student that there were other things that they could spend their time with, whether they then chose to or not, that's, that's their right. Or there are times that they're available and times that they can't be, because that's true about every child, not just children with disabilities. Everyone's got to stop doing their favorite Mm -hmm. things and go to school, which, I mean, that just (laughs) sort of makes school sound like the worst place ever or go to work or go do, you know, the chores around the house. Everyone's got to, you know. Or maybe you're hanging out with someone else who also has a very unique interest. There is some give and take there, right? About whose turn it's going to be to talk about their favorite, favorite thing. 
because I mean, no one wants to, you know, I mean, we've all been in situations where someone just won't stop talking about a particular thing yes. and it's, it's not pleasant being on the other side of that. So I, I feel like the main issue that usually is being hinted at when this is brought up to me is it's too much. It's, mm-hmm. it's the muchness. It's happening too much, too often. I don't mm-hmm. want to hear it all day. I don't want to buy every single Toy Story object we see in public. It's too much. So it's kind of, I, I don't mind a hit, but we really need to take it down. Mm. is kind of where the the meat of the issue seems to seems to live is the muchness of it yeah rather so, than the the narrowness or or oddness or you know uniqueness of it it's, it's much more the muchness of it so for example Tamika, you might want to talk about some recent twists on wandavision but you may oh, not want to, to hear yeah, about your audience did not <laughs> they're not no. here for that they yeah. might not want to hear that. <laughs> and, you want to hear that actually. and you might not want to get into the details of like, did you know that that was based on a 12 issue Nexi <laughs> right. series? In the mid- <laughs> like maybe that's more than you want to hear about vision. No, I want that. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So I think we, we've agreed upon unique interests. I think we, we talked about the pros and cons there, you know, and, and, and we'll, we'll kind of come back to it a little bit in the articles we'll be discussing, but why don't, before we do that and get into some of that research, let's take a quick break. And then when we come back, let's delve into some ways that unique interests can be incorporated in treatment planning. We'll be right back. Do you want to be a BCBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Master's of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Master's of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master's certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. RegisCollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. And we are back talking with Tamika Meadows about incorporating unique interests in our practice and in our treatment planning. Before the break, we talked all about how we're going to use the term unique interests going forward. And now we're going to talk about some specific research related to this topic. But one more thing before we do that, and that's reminding everyone listening that ABA Inside Track is ACE approved. By listening to the show, you're able to earn one learning credit. All you need to do is listen to the show and head over to our website, abainsidetrack.com slash getceus. That's G-E-T hyphen C-E-U-S. You're going to need to enter in two secret code words that we're going to talk about through the episode. We're going to do the first one right now. This is a special code word from our special guest, and it is Pietro, P-I-E-T-R-O, Pietro, which, do you want to explain to everyone what Pietro's significance is? Yes, so if I could just get like a quick three hours to just <laughs> like briefly describe, okay, no. Okay, so Pietro is Wanda's twin brother. He's amazing, and he has powers, and I'm going to stop now, but that's who that is. Very good. Yep. Very good. First appearance, X Men number four, nineteen sixty four, I think. Maybe nineteen sixty five. So, is WandaVision one of the Marvels? Yes. Yes. And okay. It's awesome. I'm so sorry. I don't awesome. know. It's okay. okay. It's all right. Jackie doesn't know. I know nothing. <laughs> Jackie came out of her cave to listen to the birds <laughs> okay. and heard a passing. One of the, the two birds were talking about the Marvel movies. And she's like, what is this Marvel these birds speak of? <laughs> Pietro. And Jackie, speaking of bird calls, let's talk about Baker's 2000 article about using unique interests in teaching game playing behavior. I like the premise of this article. 
This one is 2020. I just had to do it. Oh, no, it's not. It's 2000. It's, not 20, it's 2000. <laughs> every, every time I read it, I thought it said 2020 and I laughed, but it's not. It says 2000. I just wanted it to say 2020. We briefly discussed this in our turn-taking episode, talking about, specifically about teaching game playing behavior. This was referenced as kind of one of the early yeah. articles on the subject yeah, of playing I think I referenced games. it. Yeah, just to kind of give a little a little intro on why they thought about this was that they were like, okay, they're calling it thematic idiosyncratic activities, but they could just be unique interests, right? And here they say, okay, our you know our young children uh, that get diagnosed may have these unique interests that preclude them from other social interaction with their peers and potentially they may see less social interaction with their siblings, right? And so the authors point out that the sibling relationship is most often our first relationship from birth, but it gets more and more difficult if the child diagnosed uh, with autism seems unmotivated to play with the other sibling. But children may be motivated to engage in their own ritualistic play that could be child-preferred and it could occur frequently. So could we put these two together? And use preferences as part of a game in order to then increase sibling interaction. So very clever. And so they used three participants with low to moderate car scores, all of them engaged in in fairly high ritualistic behavior or unique interest. They had very significant unique interest. Ken, who was five, liked to repetitively make number lines on paper. And his sibling was a sister who was seven. I think that's important to note that they're fairly close in age. So playing together would be appropriate. I really like that. Although five and seven seems like it might be a little of a stretch because it might be hard, right? Seven-year-olds sometimes can play like can play like a three to five-year-old, right? But they don't Mm -hmm. want to (laughs) a lot of the times. My kids are almost four years apart and they all play together. Okay, that's good to know. I don't have I don't have a basis because I only have one. But I was just thinking about it because their rationale was, oh, these these are all like close enough in age. And so that's good. Wayne was the second participant. He was five. His sister was eight. And he liked crashing cars and talking about crashing cars. And his sister did not want to play with him because he frequently would engage in aggression toward her. And she said that he was mean and never listened. And then finally, Annie was six years old and her sister was eight years old. And Annie engaged in some repetitive speech of specific movie scripts, which I know that a lot of us do, right? (laughs) A lot of the time. Yes, yes. And so here, her sister said that Annie wouldn't let her play. She only wanted to watch specific video clips over and over again. And this was during the time of the VCR, (laughs) where you would rewind the VCR. The Matrix had only just entered the consciousness as our <laughs> first DVD here in America when this article was published. Right. Well, so it really paints uh, a picture. It does. And they're like, <laughs> and they took the VCR, like Beauty and the Beast, Cinderella. And I was like, I know. I had those <laughs> with like the big, huge video uh-huh. case. Clam oh, cases. Clamps, yeah. yeah. Oh, man. They were huge. They were so big, but I loved them so much. You still I have some of those? Oh, yeah, I oh, probably you should do. sell those on eBay. Those things are collector's items. Now. I still do. I think I have the rescuers still. The original uh, anyway. or down under? No, just the regular one. Okay. But anyway, the sessions occurred in a playroom at a university. They didn't occur at home. Generalization data were taken at home and at school uh, later on in a different time. So the therapists included undergraduate and graduate students. And what I found particularly interesting is that the data recorders were naive to the experiment to make sure that they were preventing bias, which Mm. I love. Yeah, that's awesome. That's nice. That's nice. They put there on. So sessions could last as long as 40 minutes, but they didn't have to. So whenever one of the children said that they didn't want to play anymore, sessions were over. And they looked at the percent of intervals engaged in social play, but not ritualistically engaging in that perseverative behavior during a 10-minute probe anywhere throughout that up to 40 minute play session. They looked at attention behavior. They looked at child affect. They looked at the percentage of intervals where the child engaged in that thematic interest. And then finally, a parent survey was completed. 
And so what they did here, which was pretty, pretty clever, is that they found a game that a game that required two or more players and was age appropriate for both siblings. And they made a special game out of it. So they based it like on a bingo game where you're matching and they incorporated the thematic interest into the bingo game. Yeah, they were a bunch of, bunch of bingo variants, really. Yep, bingo variants. Yeah. So, for instance, like with your bingo Ken, expansion pack. <laughs> yeah, with Ken, the bingo board had numbers, and he could put triangles around the multiples of five. Wayne, Wayne's my favorite. That one looked like the most fun, where they would shoot cars onto a board, and when the car fell down, that was the number that they had to look for on their bingo card. That one looked fun. Yeah. I would fun. play that. That's right. Really I would fun. play that too. They had like a track. And then the final for Annie, they had movie box pictures on it and you would pick a card and then you could fast forward or rewind there. That was with the symbols and you could watch the video clips and whatever video clip it was on was the bingo number. See, I thought that was that was clever. You get like a little best of package and and you get your card with like it's like 10 seconds or 30 seconds rewind or whatever. And then whatever. Yeah, whatever show it is you know, Little Mermaid or whatever, that's that's what's on the bingo card. I thought that was very clever. I mean, I, I feel like they spent most of the time on this on this article being like, how are we supposed to use crashing cars in bingo? This is, this is right? a tricky one. But yeah, <laughs> and so the design was a multiple baseline across participants design. It would have been cool if they could do it across activities, but I understand that must be very challenging. I always like to see the across activities to see if you see any generalization like within, you know, different activities, but you know, that's besides the point. It took between six and 10 months to complete the study because of the staggered baseline. And they had baseline intervention, maintenance, and follow up. So during baseline, they just pulled out all the toys. Many were bingo like. I like said that they said that. And they said to play, right? And the adult tried to initiate games and all of the things that were unique preferences to that individual were also there. So they just took data on all of those dependent variables. And then in, during the intervention, the I'm not going to lie, I, I would have liked to see a little bit more procedures here because I'm not sure I could do this myself. I think a lot of that, I think this is a pretty common concern about most of the articles that we're discussing today is it, it just felt like the fact that they did something sort of novel and they did something creative and then results, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, it's great. You did, how did you, there were, there were the kind of an assumption bing, of boom. like, well, kids, kids love games. They, they'll figure it out. Don't worry about it. Anyway, just get that track set up and you're all, you're all good. Which I, I agree, Jackie, was, was a little like, well, how am I supposed to, how would I run this? Because I'm sure it wouldn't work as well as in the article with these three exact, you know, participants. Yeah, they said there was 11 to 14 sessions across two months. So they, you know, they did spend some considerable time teaching The children had to play the game that incorporated their unique interest. They had to teach the rules of the game. They had to actually teach why someone wins. You know, basically, why would someone win and reinforce that? Because it was clear to them that not all of the the kids in the study had that skill already. And then that support was systematically faded, but they didn't tell us how or when. But... If there was an initiation, they provided prompting, (laughs) and that's what I got from it. And so following the intervention, they ran 10 to 14 sessions across one to two months of maintenance, which seems like a lot. Yeah, it does. Right? Woo! They're just, they're making sure it's it's hanging out. It's sticking. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And the maintenance part was just the same as baseline, except those newly taught games were present. And then they did a follow-up. They're like, we're not done yet. After those 14 sessions, we're going to assess at one in three months again. So, whoo! That's some thoroughness right there. Yeah, they were not cutting any corners. This does not seem like it was the master's thesis. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to keep going. So, you know, not surprising, all three participants engaged in low social play with siblings during baseline. So, Ken... It did engage in some non-ritualistic play as treatment went on. So eight out of the 10 maintenance conditions and four follow-ups. Wayne played other games during the majority of the play session and maintenance for eight out of the 10 sessions and all four follow-ups. And Annie engaged in other games in four out of the 14. So we saw increases across the board, which is pretty nice. 
We also saw increases in positive social interactions during the generalization probes at home and at school. Considerably, usually, you know, two of the participants up to 95% of, of peer social interactions and one went up to 61%. So that's pretty big, a big jump. They found more increases in joint attention behaviors and affect from neutral to happy and interested. And then what I like out of all of this is that when they interviewed the siblings, the siblings had more positive statements to say about their brother or brother or sister in this case. So some of them were, he can play some board games. It's better. <laughs> and two of the three changed responses from no, does your sibling play with you often to positive replies. So that's kind of nice, right? That is nice. Yeah. One of them was still throwing shade, kind of dissing their brother's yeah. inability to play operations. I know. Still, you know, like, <laughs> oops. So come on, let's let's give cut cut, cut your brother. Wow. Yeah, maybe that was her unique interest, though. Maybe she really wanted someone to play uh, operation with her. Maybe, maybe. yeah. <laughs> it's a two way street. And speaking of two way streets, so low social validity on this on this study because <laughs> operation was not included. Just bingo. Yeah, maybe for me, this research like highlights the two way street thing, right? Like, why are we always saying that the autistic child is the one that needs to change their behavior to fit in? with everybody else when we could be taking it from the other side and saying, what can we do to arrange this environment such that the autistic child is more compelled to participate or feel involved here, right? And they did that and they saw more interaction between the siblings and not only in the context of that one game, but in some cases branching out a Mm -hmm. little bit to other games. So to me, that was a good example of how one might make those types of modifications. I like that they were thinking about that, right? They were thinking about how we can incorporate things that, you know, the children like. And maybe, to be honest, we don't know later on, maybe now the sibling will also start liking it, right? Who knows? Mm -hmm. Because of the increased interactions, potentially. I mean, that car game sounds amazing. It really does. All (laughs) of the bingo games, the modified bingo games sound way more fun than regular bingo. Oh, yeah. Regular bingo is boring. (laughs) Regular bingo is boring. (laughs) It's like shoots and ladders. So boring. Oh, I hate that game. (laughs) Oh, no. Yeah. Shoots and ladders is is the worst. It's the worst game. It never ends and it's boring. It's a never ending (laughs) boring game. (laughs) This Candyland ends eventually. You know, shoots and ladders could could go on forever. (laughs) (laughs) That's all I'm going to say about my study. Great. Thanks, Jackie. Diana. Yeah. So I'm going to review the Vismara and Leon's study from 2007. Your enemies. No, I'm really not. I'm really not. I've liked this study for a long, long time because many of you know that I've been interested and researched joint attention for a long, long time. And hear all about joint attention, you can go back to episode 74 when I talk about it at length. But here we will just suffice to say that joint attention is generally thought of as the shared experience between two people and some other object and event in the environment. So that shared experience could look like talking about the event, looking at one another to think about the event together, pointing or gesturing towards the event as it occurs. You don't need all the pieces of that response to have it count as joint attention, but often you do see them occur together. And the reason why joint attention is thought to be important is it's an early emerging developmental skill that we see for children as early as nine months and can often be an important marker to indicate a change in the developmental trajectory for a child. And the presence of joint attention is thought to be an important component in the development of not just social behavior, but language development as well. So while I think we want to honor differences in individuals and say maybe maybe joint attention doesn't, doesn't function in the same way for different folks, it does kind of remain this like crucial early skill that does seem to be important in a variety of ways. So we can think of it as a cusp behavior. And thus far, it seems to be an important part of development. So that's why we kind of keep coming back to focusing on it. What they wanted to do in this study was look to see if we don't see joint tension occurring at high rates for an autistic child, are there things that we can do to make that joint attention be more present? (laughs) And one of the things that they decided to do in this study was say, well, these individuals have 
I think in this study they call them circumscribed interests. Am I right on that one there, Rob? No, this is perseverative interests. Oh, I'm interests. sorry. In this study, they're called perseverative interests. So they say, well, we have these perseverative interests. So what if we arrange some joint attention interactions around the perceptive interests that are present. Would that increase joint attention? And if so, would we then see generalization away from the perceptive interest to other interests as well once we've started to see this joint attention response? So that was really what they were interested in looking at here. And they had three children, all diagnosed with autism, and they were really young. So they were 26 to 38 months at the start of the study. And the study was done with them and their primary caregivers. And what they wanted to do here was they set up these opportunities for joint attention to occur in the context of the perceptive interest, which I think they call PI condition, and non-perceptive interest, which they call the NP condition. And they did a reversal design between the two. And then they followed that up with an alternating treatments design as well, just sort of add on there to the end. And what I liked about this is that they identified certain toys that the children were very, very interested in. And for these children, they all were very, very interested in like letter and number type toys. So those were their unique interests. And then what they attempted to do was match other stimuli that looked or topographically were quite similar, but did not contain that exact unique interest and use that as the NP condition. So for example, they had an ABC one, two, three book, for the unique interest. And then they paired that in the other condition with a storybook. And then they did the same with an ABC puzzle and a transportation puzzle, the game Caribou. I know, Rob, you're familiar with the game Caribou. I am. I love that game. It is a fantastic game and it's out of print and you can't get it anymore, but it's really great for teaching early letter ID. And and there's like little balls and a key and a treasure chest. It's very fun. Kind of reminds me of, of the old show King of the Hill. One of the characters makes a game called Spin Your Choice because people like to spin and people like to make choices. And I feel like Caribou oh, Peggy. is that. Yeah, Peggy, that's yeah, Peggy. Peggy. You know, yeah, Peggy. <laughs> because, you know, again, with Caribou, it's like people love treasure chests and putting <laughs> balls into holes and opening doors with a key. <laughs> it's like, that's what that game is. It's a great game, but it contains letters. So that one was paired with don't Break the Ice, which is another great game, but isn't the same oh, as Caribou. What? Sorry. Another oh. great game? You put sarcasm quotes around the great part of Don't Break the Ice there? I don't know. I feel like Don't Break the Ice takes you like three solid 37 minutes. 37 years. It takes 37 to years to put it together. And they're done seconds. in five seconds. <laughs> yes. And they're like, what are we going to do now? Crash. It's like one, you're going to watch me set this mallet. up again. That's what you're going to do. <laughs> Right. So wait. So Rob, you're saying that it is a great game? I can't tell what's going on. It's here. not a great game. It's, it's not a great awful. Game. Okay. Awful game. I like it. Jackie. Jackie's a fan. <laughs> but is it a Marvel game, Jackie? Is the question. <laughs> okay. So those two are paired together. All clearly we're all we're not getting eye away here on the pairing of those. <laughs> That's two a, I put that in the limitation section. Like nobody's gonna choose <laughs> Don't Break the Ice. <laughs> Ever. All right. all right. And then there was a, a magnet letter board. They paired that with Connect Four. I don't know enough about the letter board to know if that was a good pairing. And then they had Uno and bowling. <laughs> Just go with it, Rob. It's okay. It's okay. So the point is that some of them had letters and numbers in them, and some of them didn't. They started off really strong on the on the pairings, and then they got a little looser as they went on. I must have in skimmed table this one. I don't remember these paired games being. So I remember reading like paired games. That's a great idea. Yeah, good, good. You know, it's got to have the unique interest component. Right, be yeah. similar. And I don't think I read enough detail because I would have stopped reading this. I would be like, no, this is garbage. This is clearly no, 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 not paired not well. No, no, it's not garbage. It's fine. Not paired well. It's okay, right? Maybe, it's okay. Maybe because you. either there are, they contain the unique interest or they don't, mm. right? That's the important part Yes. here, okay? And so then the sessions that they conducted were conducted in pivotal response teaching style. It is not well defined. <laughs> That's about as that, much description you know what? as you get a, in this article. I've read a lot of PRT articles and it's, Hardly ever (laughs) well-defined in the articles. But if you read enough of them, you get the gist of it. So I'm going to give you a quick summary of what the components of pivotal response teaching or training generally are. And they would be to follow the child's lead 
include their interest in the choice of materials that are available, intersperse both acquisition tasks and maintenance tasks throughout the session, vary what the tasks are to maintain interest, reinforce correct responses and attempts, that is an important point, provide rewards immediately and contingent on the target, but the rewards that are provided are naturalistically occurring reinforcers in the environment. So all of those reinforcers that are there are embedded within the teaching session and they are directly related to the response that's occurring. It's all conducted in like a naturalistic play setting. Mm. Okay. So you're on the floor. There's lots of toys around. I feel like the best description of PRT I ever saw was the time Lynn Cagle was on the TV show Super Nanny. I saw was, that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you see that speaker? Where yeah, she's like showing episode. the little boy how to, you know, ask for more, like swinging. Mm-hmm. Like that was, I was like, oh, I get it. Okay. Cause I read a lot of articles referring to PRT and I'm like, what? I, this sounds like five other things I've seen before. <laughs> that was the best example. Yeah. So there's a lot of components there that I just think of as good, good EIBI, good ABA, yeah. right? And there are a few other things that I didn't list here that are a little bit more specific to PRT, but those are generally how the sessions run and look. So these sessions were two and a half hour sessions that they ran in the study. And the first hour, they had the primary experimenter with the parent working together, and then they faded out and the parent completed the session. And then after that, after the two and a half hour session, then they did a probe. And that was when they took the data for the for this study. And so then, like I said, it was a reversal design and it varied which condition came first, depending on the participant, but they either did the unique interest condition first for several sessions and then the (laughs) non-unique interest condition next or vice versa. And they did, I think, three of each for each participant. And then from there, they did an alternating treatments condition where each session it varied, whether they had the unique stimuli present or the other stimuli present. And yes, it did take a lot of time because these were quite long sessions that they did. It's a good thing they were PRT sessions. If they were anything else, I don't think they could have sustained the child's interest for as long as they needed. Well, that's the whole idea, right? <laughs> You're following the child's lead. So so really what they were interested in here was the number of joint attention initiations on the part of the child. And those could, the way that they define them were either verbal or nonverbal behaviors to direct the caregiver's attention to the object, event, or environment. And that might have included gaze shifts, pointing, showing, giving, or commenting. So like all those basic components they brought up. And then they also had a non-familiar observer, so someone else come in and give an overall rating of the child's interest and happiness from a later videotape probe, which is kind of a Mm -hmm. nice like secondary measure as well. Yeah. So in baseline, no one had any joint attention initiations and the unique interest condition they started to see more of those occur and then less when they went back to the ununique. I'm sorry, I'm not doing a good job <laughs> translating my we terms. We don't want to use, the, we don't like I'm the terminology to, of this I'm one, trying to keep the terms yeah. all the same. Back to the non-unique, they saw a drop back into baseline levels. But then when they went to the alternating treatments condition and started going back and forth between the two types of conditions, they began to see more joint attention responses occur in the non-unique sessions as well, for the most part, which is pretty exciting. And it did take a long time for them to get to this point. So there's always the possibility that, you know, just the time that was spent with those additional materials made them a little less novel. Maybe they became more interesting over time, right? But one could also make the argument that there was a lot of rapport building in the context of those unique interests with the both the experimenter and the caregiver that led them to start to see more of these joint attention type responses occurring. That's true. I mean, I think the use of the reversal really makes me more comfortable in the author's final point of that it was the use of the unique interests that increased the you know amount of joint attention bids and joint attention behaviors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Related to the affect too, they started to see they definitely saw a higher positive affect with the unique interest, but they did start to see more of that carryover as well with the others. And that's an important point with respect to joint attention because research has demonstrated that you can teach the response, right? You can teach the response topographically, but does that mean that you're actually teaching the function of joint attention? Because the idea of joint attention mm-hmm. is that I see something cool and I want to check in to see if you see the same cool thing that I do, right? Mm-hmm. So it's inherently a social event. 
So the fact that they not only saw it in the unique interest, but in the non-unique interest, and that that didn't just look like a rote response, mm-hmm. but it had some of that positive affect to it, is a really important secondary measure and notification there that perhaps it wasn't just a taught response, but mm-hmm. it really was trying to share something that was cool and interesting and neat, right? Yeah. And and you can 100% see the difference in a kid <laughs> between just some, I, I've been told I'm supposed to make this response now, right? Versus, totally. well, look at this yeah. cool thing, right? But it's hard to have that translate into the research that you re- that really is what happened. But I will have to trust them that that really is what they saw happen here. And it was pretty cool. Pretty cool that they were able to get that type of response. Thanks, Diane. Yeah. So no problem. I'm going to briefly touch upon the, the Boyd et al. 2000 article, because again, I, I think it's going to repeat the theme that's been in our other article so far, which is if one were to use unique interests in treatment planning, you will likely see more positive results. And certainly these aren't the only studies that are using these techniques and there's more research to be done, but you know, here's another one that sort of adds to the base of literature. And in this article, they're referring to what we're calling unique interests as circumscribed interests, which sounds very technical and very boring. So we'll just kind of keep going back to our unique interests terminology, which is certainly better than the restricted repetitive behaviors that they sort of start the article in, in describing how, you know, autistic children have restricted repetitive behaviors. A uh, lot of acronyms in this article, which I never appreciate because it is hard to keep track, especially when you're making up new acronyms. I know restrictive repetitive <laughs> behavior isn't one, but <laughs> circumscribed interests, like you chose to make that. Like that that's not <laughs> the title in any of these other articles. And this is 2007. So there have been other articles on the same topic. In any case, you know, the authors here really looking at some of the other research, you know, they, they reference the Baker article, they reference an article by Charlotte Christie, looking at how these unique interests actually can often show, you know, the, the children can show more preference for those interests than they do for something like food, which we always think of food as being the best reinforcer of all time. But apparently it's not always the case in comparison to the use of unique interests. Then kind of asking the questions, okay, great. So we know that unique interests may lead to better outcomes in some of these other studies, but A, how do you determine what the unique interest is meaningfully rather than just counting on, you know, parent report? You know, is there a way that we can systematically determine what is a relevant unique interest for the student that might be important to incorporate into treatment planning? And then also, do we see a change in interaction with peers or just in general peer-related social behavior when unique interests are utilized versus, say, you know, lower preference is, is the term they use. So lower preference items in terms of social bids or social play. So we have uh, a number of five-year-olds that engage in low rates of initiations to peers, low rates of social interactions in their, in their school. And again, the children all sort of ranged from either not scoring as autistic or having mild or moderate autism on the CARS scale. And I think this is true about a lot of the research we're discussing today is it's either, you know, students who'd be classified now as like high functioning autism or having mild autism on some of the rating scales. And these were sort of pullout sessions, you know, for two of the three participants that were used here. They'd get these descriptive assessments. They'd talk to their teacher. They'd talk to their mothers and say, what does your child like as a, as a they call it circumscribed interest, but, you know, we're calling unique interests through the use of interviews. You know, what is it that they spend a lot of their time engaging in? What's something they spend a lot of time and a high intensity with when, when they're focusing on to sort of determine some possible targets of these unique interests? And then they sort of looked at, okay, well, when we've got all these alternate tangible stimuli available and the circumscribed interest available, how long does the child, you know, spend on, on, you know, these various interests? And so we have Jason and Alan and Jin, our three participants. Jason loved Thomas trains and he spent a ton of time during this sort of probe playing with the Thomas trains. Alan, also Thomas trains. And then Jin liked a construction truck. So, you know, given all of these different items, what do they spend the most time on? And then what they looked at was, all right, well, what if we included these unique interests in opportunities for social interactions? So they had two conditions. They had a choice condition and an alternating treatment condition. I'll talk about the choice condition first. So the choice condition, you've got your sort of, you know, typical experimental room with tape going down the middle like it's a bad sitcom. You know, no one can agree on what side they're going to be on. 
And you've got two peers, each of them holding an item. One peer is holding the item of unique interest, so the Thomas trains or the construction truck. And the other peer is holding some other some other item that the child didn't choose in any of the other kind of descriptive analyses. The peer was told, respond to any bid from the participant. So respond if the participant comes over and starts trying to play with you. And every 30 seconds, they'd bring the participant back to the center line and let them choose where they wanted to go. So they were making discrete choices about where they wanted to spend their time. And the researchers were looking at, okay, where do they spend their most time? You know, what percentage of time do they spend in each of these quadrants? But also, what's the latency to going to the different areas? And then the other condition they did was the alternating treatment condition. And in this one, there was no tape. There was only one peer, and that peer either had the item of the unique interesting item or a low preference item. And then there was a duplicate of whatever item they were holding two to three feet away from that, that peer. And the child was just said, here you go, go play. Here they were really looking at, okay, where does the child spend most of their time? And what's the latency for them spending the time with the peer versus just playing with the unique item alone? So again, in one, they had a choice of kind of play with peer with the item that they clearly prefer versus some other item. The other, they could have played with their unique interest item at any point. They didn't have to play with the peer at all. So what percentage of time did they choose the unique versus low preference? I don't want to say peer, but you know the peer with those items. And also what percentage of time did they engage in social interactions and how long did it take before they engaged during these little five, and they were just five minute sessions. So in the choice sessions, we have Jason, who likes his Thomas trains. He spent about half of his time with the unique interest item. Alan spent 100% of the time with the unique interest item. And Jin spent uh, almost 100% of his time with the unique interest item. So again, it was with a peer with that item. When it was an alternating treatments condition, however, they had much higher percentage of interactions with the peer if that unique item was included. So it was, you know, 48% for Jason, it was 48% for Alan, and it was about 28% for Jin. So while they didn't spend potentially more time with the peer, they were much more likely to spend time with the peer if the peer had that unique item than some other item. They also showed a lot uh, lower latency to that social engagement. Similar to the article you discussed, Diana, they looked they had a blind observer doing kind of, hey, how much do you think the kid is enjoying these interactions? Did they seem more fun? with the peer when they have the unique item. And yes, all of the blind observers said, yeah, they, they look they look pretty good. They look like they're having a lot more fun in this session versus that session. And of course, the observer didn't know whether it was the unique interest session or the low preference item session. So again, that same idea of, hey, the kids seem to be having more fun when they're using items that they seem to like. You know, so- When you put it that way, it sounds like- <laughs> so, I mean, it sounds like such an easy- very thing. basic We need research idea. on this. Kids like the things they like. They don't like the things they don't like. Hmm. And yet- and yet, this is an important topic. It is a very important topic. So again, I think this one of all the four articles is sort of the most like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Of course. Why wouldn't that be the, res- the response you'd expect to get? So, you know, the authors felt like for at least two of the three participants, there was that clear delineation between I'm choosing my preferred unique item versus a low preference item. So the authors posit, hey, this might be an interesting method to determine the highly preferred, unique, interesting items for that participant. So not just counting on the interview and only going there, not just using a more kind of stock free operant kind of reinforcer assessment, but actually using an assessment, there's a meaningful interaction engaged. In in this case, you know, a social interaction, which is sort of what we're looking for. You know, we want to be able to increase social interactions for everyone when they're interested. And if we can see a, a change in that social interaction, oh, great. Well, this is a good toy that you might want to have in, say, your preschool for these, you know, these were these were younger children. Again, some of the same limitations, I think, were in some of the other articles. We're talking about small sample size. These were all high-functioning autistic children, so have clear preferences or are able to make more choices in their day. And, you know, they were in a little room. They weren't weren't in the classroom for most of the participants. So it's hard to say whether or not this is going to be a generalizable result. But still, adding more strength to our overall kind of thesis of today's episode, right? We have one more article, and this is not really a research article in the way you think of a research article. It's more like a fun story that somebody wrote out. But I think in terms of all three of these, I don't know if the rest of you agree, but I feel like this was the most useful article if I were going to try to convince someone to use a child's unique interests at school, at like a school setting. This article probably reads the easiest and would be the most convincing even though we would all consider it to have like the least amount of experimental control of any of these. Does it have any experimental control might actually be part of that because it's really more of a social validity survey 
than anything else. Yeah, I do agree with that. I, I really like it. And I reading it, I found myself thinking of how I could like start doing it with like current clients. Like I was oh, yeah. like, oh, this is yeah. really cool. Like how how would I do that? Like, yeah, it definitely like got, got wheels turning for me. So Tamika, would you mind taking the lead on on discussing this one? And then we'll kind of jump in as we go. So basically, like you were saying, they were in a, a kind of primary school setting and they were looking at three kids in the classroom and they wanted to kind of figure out how they could get them more motivated to participate in activities going on in the classroom, kind of helping that relationship between the teaching staff and the children. And then helping the staff kind of, I want to say, change perceptions a little bit of the things that these students were doing, which, again, I feel like is super, super relevant because that's that's something I deal with all the time is kind of explaining to people, okay, let's look at this a different way instead of treating this like that thing he does that distracts from what we really have to do. Like, like let's kind of reframe that to you found something that's super motivating. Mm. Okay, that's great because that could be really hard to do. So now that we've found it, like, what do we do about that? Because just kind of, you know, saying, oh, it's not time for that. You don't want to do that. You're fighting against a natural motivator. That's not going to go well. So let's figure out a different way to handle that. So they did kind of have some different conversations around, you know, well, what what do we call this is, you know, which we, we talked about earlier. Is it a repetitive behavior? Is it a rigid fixation? Is it, you know, what do we call this, this thing that you're fascinated with or obsessed with or stuck on or fixated on? And which really kind of reflects the, the way that it's going to be viewed, the way that it's going to be accepted, the way that the other children present are going to accept it and deal with it. And a lot of autistics would say that these kind of, you know, unique interests are fundamental to their well-being. They, they are not a hobby. They are not yeah. a quirk. It, it, it is a part of kind of what makes them them. So they would see it as being something that kind of is almost, almost part of their identity in a way and like a unique skill set versus, you know, this, this thing I do that other people don't like when I do it. Mm. Yeah. The section that I really liked is when they they had like these multiple pages where they actually showed you like a little like visual of, mm-hmm. of the, the special interest map, which I thought was so cool. So it's like it's like this, this diagram where they put all this information about the kid and like, you know, this is what they like and this is what motivates them. Like, you know, they like to run or they like to spin or they like flashing lights or they like to talk about, you know, 1970s records or something, then they would like connect it to like curriculum. So because you like blank, here's how we can connect that to this thing we need to do in the instructional day to make it more interesting for you and to make it more enjoyable for you and to kind of give you an opportunity in your day to be able to talk about this thing or to do this thing, you know, depending on on exactly what that special interest was. And it's pretty detailed. And I feel like a clinician could look at that. Like we were saying with some of the earlier ones, they kind of left you like, well, how would I do that? But I feel like you could look at this one and say, okay, that's not so, that's not so tough. I could do that. Like I could, I could pick a client. And I could do some interview and talk to their parents and do some observation and I could make a little diagram and I could show it to the staff. So that was probably my favorite part. Another really good point they made is that the special interest kind of being embedded into school day or the curriculum helps with alternating between calming and activating activities because as we discussed earlier, a a big component of these kind of interests is the muchness. So the, the individual has a hard time kind of turning it off. So if, it, if it's something that's activating, you know, it's going to be hard to kind of redirect or say, hey, let's go do this now. We've been doing that for a while. How about we switch to this? That's going to be tough. 
So kind of planning it out and saying, okay, so we're going to, we're going to do this activity that maybe is either neutral or even non-preferred. And then we're going to do this really super preferred thing that you're going to like a lot, but we're not going to do it all day. We're, we're going to then switch to something else. I thought that was really cool too, to make just like these natural transitions in the day and communicating it to the kids. So it's not like this abrupt, I'm, you know, I'm taking you away from mm-hmm. that thing you love so much, or I'm shutting down the conversation about that topic you like to talk about so much. And the, the map is created through interviewing caregivers, parents, teachers, people who know this child very, very well. If you're able to, you can actually interview the child, talk to them about their interests. Why do you like that? What do you like about it? And then just, you know, good old observation, hanging out with that kid, watching them as they do it, seeing what they like about it. If the, you know, environment is loud or quiet, or if it's morning or afternoon, does that have an effect on how much they like to do this thing or talk about that thing? They got some really good feedback from the teachers after they put this special interest map strategy in place. It was very positive. And the teachers described feeling like they understood these kids better, which I personally think is huge because feeling a a better relationship with this child you're trying to teach has a very big, big part to do with, with teaching. And it helped with classroom time management. So kind of being able to know when do I need to kind of focus in and apply the strategy versus when are we kind of going through like the regular flow of the day, mm-hmm. which, which I also feel like is important for a teacher because, you know, as we know, like they, most of the interventions we give them have to be incorporated into their day. You know, we kind of can't give them something to do that's going to take up all their time. So it, it had like this natural flow where here's the parts of the day where you're going to be really, really kind of focusing in on this. And then here's the parts of the day where, you know, you're just kind of doing your thing. It also encouraged multidisciplinary communication because, you know, the more people who know this child and can kind of talk about their unique interests, the better. It enhanced student well-being. The kids seem to like being at school more. They liked being in class. They liked to participate. They seem to be enjoying interacting with the teacher when they were kind of working through the, the curriculum or the instruction that had their unique interest embedded in it. The teachers reported feeling more confident. There was a lot of feedback about the teachers saying that, you know, I know how to, to reach him or her now. I know how to communicate with them. I, you know, their eyes light up when I start talking about that topic that they really love to talk about. It's just nice. That was nice to see. The teachers reported that it increased the student ability to access the curriculum. So they were better able to benefit from being in the classroom and, you know, from being at school by the special interest map being embedded into not just what the teachers were teaching, but how the teachers were teaching. A big strength mentioned in the article is that common school assessments or even the IEP, they do give information about students, but it tends to be deficit focused, as we know. Or it's like that one line of like, they oh love my writing, God. love drawing. I like, hear that all the time. And, I, and I've been guilty of it myself. I oh, have. Yeah. I've been guilty oh, yeah. of that one line. And then you're like, all right, let's dig into deficits, you know, for <laughs> 47 who cares? pages. Who cares about that? Yeah, let's get like, all oh, that stuff we got to work on. He's yeah. super friendly. And then here's 48 pages of things he's not doing. You know, this is like the opposite. Like, like this is yeah. like, you know, hey, this little guy loves to talk about, you know, black and white movies. He's fascinated by black and white movies. And, you know, if you start talking about that or you show pictures of that or if you can incorporate that into your lesson, you are going to have his attention. He is going to be motivated. He is going to want to engage. Like, he is going to be all about it. So I thought that was really cool, too. It definitely went beyond just their preferred, you know, reinforcers as well. It went into, yeah. You know, they have sensory preferences or mm-hmm. sensitivities. Then even, even things that we helpful to teachers, like what's your attention span? I'm mean, kind of looking at Elliot's special interests for his maths, because this was a, yes. a British a British <laughs> study. You know, what kind of prompts might be useful? But, you know, also what types of activities will he engage in, you know, longer time? What does he like to read? What does he like to play with? What shows does he like to watch? 
which yeah, again, it goes way beyond the sort of like one, two line. Uh, Absolutely. Oh, love, yeah. Loves TV. It's like, okay, great. There's a lot of TV, like bewitch reruns. What's this kid watch? And- right. <laughs> <laughs> and how do I incorporate that into, into what we have to do today? Because I, I feel like that's such a, like without the detail of these these maps that they include, if you just said to a teacher, hey, he loves Hot Wheels, if you could work that in the day, that would be great. Like that's super right. vague. Like what does that mean? But like this is, this is so much detail that yeah. they include to where you look at it and you're like, okay, why have I not been doing this? Like this makes so much more sense. It just, it's like a little snapshot of that kid. I do think this is an exciting start. I did read this and say, I want to try this. I then again, you know, put my sort of like, well, I'm going to be pessimistic for a minute kind of hat on. And okay, so one of the challenges, while all the teachers loved the map, none of them actually made the map. I believe they were all made by the specialist person who sort of was, you know, pioneering the use of this specific map. Though the questionnaires are modified, you know, there's nothing, they're in the article, they're nothing too, you know, mind-blowing about these questionnaires. They're generally just good drilling down kind of questions. So again, what if the teachers had to make these maps first? Would Mm. they be able to get as meaningful a map as the ones here? I think that, you know, teachers are pretty creative. So I'm sure they could have Mm -hmm. come up with some of the ideas. Like I'm going to use, what was it? Like I'm looking at Elliot's again. These Legos. The high score of a Mario game to Mm -hmm. to place value activity, or I'm going to practice using Luigi's racing car. Teach teachers how to make a map. Well, here's our, I think there's our follow up right there. Uh Do we just pull in? Do we just pull in? I think we pulled in. (laughs) Let's pull in. Let's pull into the dissemination station. Because I think, in terms of, hey, I want other professionals to use these unique interests. Like you said, Tamika, just being like, hey, you should totally use kids' unique interests in treatment plants. Like, okay, yeah, thanks so much. I got a billion things to work on. My boss is breezing down my neck to like meet these IP goals. I'm sure I'll get that Lego video in there somehow. I'll make sure they get to watch it when they're done with my 10 activities I need them to do. This feels very much like, hey, here are some cool ideas. I don't know a teacher who wouldn't read this and say, wow. What a great! I could do this, or I could use this special interest to teach this or that. is is a really great, especially for the students who are already being, you know, primarily educated in specialized programs. Right. Where you know what I need you to teach about circumference. How do you teach about circumference? It doesn't matter because they're being taught one to one or in a small group. So you could really be as creative as you want to be, and I think these maps give license to creative in a very productive way rather than just trying to be fun. You know, I'm just going to think of something fun I like and try to make this fun for everybody. I'm going to use the child's unique interests. I also want to see, did the child actually do better on the skill? Because while it is great that they, you know, they had that one example of the student who had hundred SIBs down to one SIB a day. If they then didn't learn a single academic skill across that same period of time, hmm, you know, it's great that the problem behavior went down, but they still have to learn academic skills at school. So is this effective in that regard? That's not a deal breaker in terms of using unique interests, but it is a question that absolutely someone's going to yeah. ask who's in charge of money or in charge of whether you get to keep using unique interests. <laughs> right. So right. you probably want to have an answer, right? <laughs> but several of these studies started with the unique interest and then were able to branch out yes. from there, right? Yeah. But I would like to see more. And that's a, that's a good point, Diana. Yeah. We, we did see that in almost every study. Start with the unique interests and then, hey, magic, other interests kind of come into play. <laughs> but I don't think it's magic. I think it's no. building that trust with, mm-hmm. with your client. Yeah. It reminds me of some of the good behavior game studies we did where they use good behavior game in the specialized classroom for kids with all the problem behavior kids. And kind of the lesson learned from that was it wasn't that these kids didn't know how to behave appropriately or didn't know how to engage in pro-social behavior. It was they didn't have an environment that really reinforced the Mm -hmm. behavior they had. So they just didn't engage in it. The reinforcers weren't there. It's the same idea. I've always said that being a behavior analyst is a really creative job. And that's my favorite part of the job is getting to figure out how to make this work for this individual Mm -hmm. child. Right. So like this stuff's right up my alley because it just gives you like so many ideas about ways you can incorporate special it's interests. Like, and, yeah. It's one of those energizing topics yeah. too, where, I mean, everyone, you do the job long enough. I don't care how creative you were when you started, you fall into the rut where it's the same DTT programs. It's the same mm-hmm. TAs because it's yeah. hard to keep up like a high, high level of creativity all the time. And I think looking at this map was so much fun, even though there were a lot of, you know, research-based questions, it was just very exciting to think of, oh, wow. 
these are great ideas. Wouldn't it be yeah. great to incorporate some of this? And you kind of get that that little mojo back for planning. You know, I'm going to do something exciting with these ideas. And just really, I mean, I think that this is something you can look at and you can say, I could give this to, you know, three different staff members and they might then translate it in three different ways. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this person might take it and embed it into reading and this person might take it and embed it into music. And then, so it's, that's also cool too, because it's like, okay, how many different things can we do with, you know, these two to three unique interests that you have? Like, it's just, I don't know. I feel like there's just all these different possibilities with a strategy like this. Yeah. I don't know if you all caught the giant limitation in Elliot's special interest map. It did state that they wanted to use Luigi, who's one of his favorite characters, to do math. Nobody chooses to be Luigi as their favorite <laughs> I, character. I so. actually choose to be Luigi. <laughs> of course you do, Jackie. <laughs> Luigi's my number one. And then if the princess is available, she's my number two. <laughs> I mean, the princess is awesome. So. Right. Yeah. So well, it depends on the game. Depends on the game. I took offense to this, Rob, when I saw this. <laughs> you, you took offense to my statement that no one wants to choose Luigi? Yeah. You know what? The, I think that's oldest sibling, firstborn child privilege jumping out when, when you know. I actually, I actually bought my brother a shirt that says, little brothers get Luigi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> our, our children also have the same shirt as well. <laughs> That's some Luigi hate right there. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, you know I don't, I don't appreciate that's it. That's what that is. Uh-oh. I don't hate Luigi, but when Nintendo called one year, I forget which year it was now, the year of Luigi, it was one of their worst financial years ever. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> the game where he goes in a haunted house, I think, is a very good game. I appreciate Luigi. I'm, 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 I'm kidding. I'm kidding, everyone. Luigi's a great character. Is it anyone's yeah, favorite? Don't write angry mm-hmm. letters. You're going to get I, yeah. angry letters. <laughs> it's yeah. going to be more anger than we get for any episode <laughs> we've ever done. I used to like your podcast, but your anti-Luigi statements are really... I'm not anti-Luigi. They'll like me. I like Luigi just fine. I'm never going to choose him first, though. All right. Well, I don't know. I, I, I think we're all we feeling... we the end of the podcast. I, yeah, we started talking about <laughs> Luigi preferences. I think we're all very excited to use something like a map. And, and I think something like this, this map of special interests to, you know, really catalyze new research on this topic, especially school related research, which we mm-hmm. definitely need more school based research to begin with, would just be be fascinating. So again, students, if you're out there and you're saying, what do I want? I want to do something with school and specialized interests of autistic children. Look at that. There you go. Start with this Davy article, structure it a little more. You've got yourself a beginning research article. Wow. Oh. All right. Well, I think we've done a nice kind of survey of some ways to use unique interests in our treatment planning and some fun ideas. I think that's the nice thing too, is when, when you have something that's got some research and is fun is always a, a definite benefit, right? Yes. Oh boy. I guess it's it's about time to go. But before we do, Tamika, thank you so much, so much for coming on the show, for wanting to talk about unique interests, for saying, let's talk about that. And you know, starting us off and suggesting these articles. It was a lot of fun to talk about. If folks are interested in reaching out to you or want to read more of your work, where should they go? I would tell them to go to iloveaba.com. That is where they can get in touch with me. They can read some things. They can find my books. Like Everything's kind of there in one place for them. Once again, big, big thank you to Tamika Meadows from the iloveaba.com for coming on the show and talking with us about this very exciting topic. We all had a lot of fun, and we hope you did too. Again, if you want to follow Tamika or write to her about this or any of the topics she writes about, that's iloveaba.com. And if you enjoyed listening to one of our interviews or one of our topics, we'd really love it if you continue to do so, perhaps by subscribing to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you like to get your podcasts. There are a lot of other ways you can reach out to us as well. Certainly, you can go to our website, abainsidetrack.com, to find links to these episodes as well as links to the articles discussed and a place to purchase CEs for the episodes. You can also... Find us on social media everywhere as ABA Inside Track. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter. You can find us on YouTube on our YouTube page where these episodes also go live with the YouTube subtitling feature. 
And if you're interested in more ABA Inside Track, why not join us on our Patreon page, where for just $5 a month, you are able to join our social tracker group, where we have bi-monthly meetups with other BCBAs chatting about, oh, you know, usually one given topic and then a lot of other kind of fun topics. If you're interested in maybe more content, you can also join us at our higher levels to get access to full-length book club podcasts worth two CEs each, as well as even a chance to join us on the show and discounts at the CE store. Just go to patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track for more information and to sign up. Finally, if you're interested in purchasing CEs for this episode, you probably want to hear that second secret code word. And here it is, chickadee, C-H-I-C-K-A-D-E-E, chickadee. It's a bird or like one of those old golden age, hey, my little chickadee characters. I threatened everyone that I'd do that accent the whole time and they uh, all left and made me do this recording all by myself. So, oh well, chickadee. And with that, we come to the end of another episode of ABA Inside Track. We hope you enjoyed it. If you have ideas for episodes or any feedback, you can also write us at abainsidetrack at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. But until next time in our full-length episode next week on another topic, keep responding. Bye. Bye.